uh, Dr. Garrett is, has been, as, as everyone knows, very much involved in the area of sterilization and disinfection and has had a lot of experience in addressing some of the problems associated with um, medical devices when they are not handled and managed correctly. So he has agreed to give us an update kind of on what is happening with medical devices. These are reusable items, items that we, we don't uh, use once and then throw away, but those devices that we will use repeatedly and some of the failures that have occurred in the device contamination. So uh, Hudson, thank you for bringing your expertise to us today and let me turn it over to you. Awesome, thanks very much Ruth, I appreciate it. And, and as Ruth mentioned, I think this is a topic that I'm particularly passionate about because it really implicates everything in healthcare, right? And we'll talk about sort of the, the non-critical all the way up through the critical items and the risk associated with each one of them. Um, but I want to start with really looking at some of the recent FDA safety alerts that have come out in different categories, right? Unfortunately, this tells us that we have a broader problem in infection control world, right, related to these types of medical devices. The second area is really what can we do about it, right? And really the third bucket is how do we operationalize some of these things within our health system, whether it's an inpatient setting or an outpatient setting, or potentially eliminate some of the risk when it's possible, so if you look at this picture, right, you see a traditional perioperative environment, you see lots of pieces of equipment, um, you know, people refer to this as the sterile environment, which sort of makes me laugh because we know that there's no environment in the hospital that's sterile. Even when sterile equipment and items are opened, they are no longer sterile as soon as they contact the non-sterile air. And so our goal is not to keep everything sterile, but it's to keep everything as clean as possible and keep it aseptic. Right. And so when we think about this in terms of medical devices, we've got to know where the device is intended to be used, right? Sort of that intended use. And then according to the spotting classification, that tells us how to reprocess it, right? And those levels of reprocessing can vary by the type that we use and honestly, where we use it in a facility. Um, even some of the same pieces of equipment, you may have differing opinions. Right, related to different service lines. And I'll give you a example that Ruth and I are both very familiar with, which is ultrasound probes, right? Which are used for purposes of vascular access device placement. You know, if you're scanning intact skin, great, that's not a problem. But the second you make a, you know, a break or a nick or you use a scalpel in that skin and then scan across that, that skin is no longer sterile. It is no longer intact, if you will. And so the device itself can actually contaminate that and it changes the level um, uh, of disinfection and reprocessing that we should really actually try to accomplish. So let's think about this in sort of three buckets, right? Medical devices can fall into one of these three. The most common that we see in healthcare is non-critical devices. These are the things that we see everywhere, right? Our blood pressure cuffs, our stethoscopes, our pulse oximeters um, that come in contact with unbroken skin. So everything is intact. Then we've got a level up from that, which is our semi-critical devices, which is a pretty growing category, frankly. Um, you know, this is going to be like laryngoscope blades and handles. Um, endoscopes come to mind, which are probably the largest one in this category. And keep in mind that endoscopes are kind of unique because they're used in many different places. They're used in hospitals, they're used in ambulatory surgery centers, and they're also used in private physician practices. And so this makes the risk even exponentially higher because of the different levels of reprocessing that are out there. And then lastly is critical items, which we know are going to always be sterile because they come in contact with sterile body tissue, right? So sort of think about those differences. Critical is always sterilized, contact with sterile body tissue. Semi-critical is going to come in contact with mucous membranes, and we're looking for a minimum of high-level disinfection. And non-critical is intact skin, and the minimum by CDC standards is low-level disinfection. Now, that's a lot to remember it's even harder to operationalize this, especially when multiple different departments have pieces of equipment, sometimes that we don't even know they bring into the building. And then, oh, by the way, we've got a problem. So let's look at something as basic as a glucometer, right? Years ago, we had outbreaks of hepatitis B and HIV associated with transmission. And it wasn't necessarily really because of the glucometer itself. It was the Lansing device that people were using. We know that we can't reuse needles, right? And unfortunately, these lancing devices that were being used, of, particularly in long-term care, were never designed for multiple resident use. Those were designed for single residents, you know, something that was more of a consumer product. And while they're convenient, right, and they prevent us from having to, you know, take that lancet and do the manual punch, 
um, they became problematic because they have springs in there. And so essentially the blood would go back up into the spring. You can, of course, um, clean that or disinfect that and it could infect the next patient right? It's important to go back to what was the intended use of those devices. Those were single patient use. That was how they were regulated. That's how they were sold. And they were only for commercial use in the consumer setting. They were never for designed for hospital settings. They're actually labeled not for that. Um, and so it's important to think even with basic stuff, we still got risk. Well, then if we take it a step further, these are just a few of the news articles that I picked related to deadly superbugs, um, particularly with endoscopes. We know that endoscopes come in different forms and fashions. We've got bronchoscopes, uretoscopes, we've got, um, you know, uh, sigmoid scopes, we've got uh, colonoscopes, all kinds of stuff. And then, of course, we've got our high-risk procedure, which is our ERCP. Unfortunately, what we found is that with all of these devices, not only do we have device design issues, but we have tons of reprocessing failures. Those reprocessing failures, despite the best intentions of the reprocessing team, lead to contamination, right? And that contamination can then unfortunately translate to patient harm, or in some cases, unfortunately, patient death. Here's a couple other examples of more bug-specific things, particularly in the environment. And Pseudomonas is just a bad bug, right? And it certainly loves the presence of water, and I can't think of a better place for pseudomonas to grow than a dark endoscope that's black, right? It doesn't have any way to get the, the water really out of there very efficiently. And it's going to sit in a dark place, right? Those are all just great criteria for growth um, of organism, especially when there's residual water. You know, we've also seen people that have done sort of workarounds using something like alcohol flushes. Now, alcohol is a great drying agent, don't get me wrong, but alcohol is also microbial fix, uh, fixant. And so it, it's really going to attach whatever's left in there from a microbe standpoint um, to the actual side of the device. And that's what can lead to the formation of biofilms. Now, we can't control everything, right? But there are different things that we can control. We can control reprocessing. We can control sort of our validation of that. We can look at, are we following the instructions for use? We can look at even the types of devices we're using. Is this something that is practical for us to actually utilize? Now, when we get towards the end of the presentation, I'll talk a little bit about different options, right? Because maybe we don't want to go down this path. Uh, maybe we want to say, I don't want to put so much, you know, so many eggs, if you will, in one basket of reprocessing the medical devices. Maybe I want to go down the single use path in, if that's something that is a, of an opportunity for me. But that's not always something that we have the option for. So here's another sort of layer to this onion. Um, the FDA was receiving lots and lots of adverse event reports associated with duodenoscopes. This was several years ago to the point where then it actually got into the news media, which then it got to Congress, and then there was a congressional mandate to investigate this. And they found that there were hundreds of people that had become severely ill, and unfortunately, many patients had actually died from these infections. And so they wanted to look at something called a 522 study. Uh, many of you probably have never heard of this because it's not something we see often. It is essentially a government-mandated study through the FDA for a regulated device. And so F essentially FTA says to the manufacturers, you must do this. Here's sort of the, the order, if you will. Here's the timeline, here's the protocol, and here's what it needs to be done by. And failure to comply would result in immediate removal of those devices from the market. And so FDA really had sort of two different intentions with this. One was to say, how can we make sure that these devices are clean once they're appropriately reprocessed and the second was, how do we validate the training um, to figure out whether or not if people actually follow the training, is it even effective? And, you know, you would think the answer to those questions would be yes, but you'll find very quickly, and I'll show you some data here in a second, that was not the case at all. Uh, it was actually quite alarming. So in terms of criteria for success, because we always want to know what we're measuring, right? They wanted to look at this in terms of CFU, colony forming units, and they really looked at two different buckets, high concern or low or moderate. Now think of low or moderate in terms of like if you're doing a blood culture and you get a lot of commensal organisms back and you know they're contaminants and the patient's totally asymptomatic, afebrile, no indications at all of systemic infection. And you've got this blood culture that doesn't match the patient in front of you and you see some of these organisms, you can really effectively say, well, I've got a contaminated blood culture. What we're looking for here is what commensal organisms might be really prevalent in the environment 
but are less likely to cause human disease and infection. So that's sort of that bucket. Um, and what they were looking for was less than 100 of those. And then the, the more high-risk bucket, they called high concern, right? And so the FDA's expectation, right, frankly, was that there would be zero. Um, now, keep in mind that this class of medical devices is not sterile, right? It is only a semi-critical device, so it is reprocessed using high-level disinfection. So the thought of something that is not even treated as a sterile device is not sterilized. Being sterile by the FDA was way off the mark, right? And so what they ended up with was, you know, less than 10, right? That's what they were actually trying to accomplish, but um, they really wanted zero was the goal. So here are the results for the three different um, categories out there in terms of manufacturers. And Olympus is by far the biggest in this category. Uh, there was one called Pentax and then a smaller one called Fuji. Um, if you look at the totals there, the ends, right, you'll see that they're widely disparate. Um, so Olympus being the biggest market player had almost 1,500 samples. Uh, Pentax on 700 and Fuji actually had a very, very low number and they had some issues with their studies as well. But if you look at the high concern organisms, right, remember FDA's expectation was zero. And yet we saw as high as 5% of properly reprocessed endoscopes, all following the validated instructions for use, still had high concern pathogens, right? Now, this was just representative of, you know, less than 3,000 endoscopes, right? But this tells you that there was a massive issue both with device design, the training, the validation, and the actual reprocessing. And so FDA said, oh my gosh, what are we going to do now? Because now we have data that says that these devices are harming people. And so they started looking at other factors like the AERs and what types of environmental contamination were present. What was going on with reprocessing, right? Were there things that we needed to deal with there in terms of like role-specific competency? And we also found a lot of variability in, in, in sampling technique. Um, part of this study was to do sterile sampling of the device. There was a protocol established, there was a laboratory process, but a lot of hospitals elected to try to do that in-house, right? And most um, hospital laboratories are not set up to do this type of testing. And so the use of an FDA certified environmental lab is really preferable here. And there's not very many of them uh, in the United States that are set up to do this type of work. So part of this then yielded out a couple of findings, right? We knew that there were wide varieties of people doing reprocessing right? It's a very high turnover position. Um, you had people that were using products and technologies in there, like using a regular toothbrush to um, scrub devices. And that was something that was not part of the reprocessing validation. Um, another one that's commonly seen is they would leave the devices soaking wet, hanging upside down in the cabinet. Well, then they would find mold, right? Because of course, if you've got a dark area, you've got lots of moisture present and you have no way to evaporate that and dry it then you're going to have uh, an environment that's ripe for mold growth. And that is certainly not something that we want to see with our patients. And so from all this, the FDA said, well, we've clearly got to do something. We've got to take some level of action that certainly saves space for us as a regulatory agency, doesn't disrupt the clinical market, but still moves the needle forward. And so what they started doing was issuing a series of safety alerts. Now, keep in mind that the FDA issuing a safety alert, it sounds big and bad and scary, but it doesn't have a ton of teeth, unfortunately. Remember the FDA has no power to regulate the practice of medicine. They have no power to enforce anything in hospital. Um, they, now they can go after manufacturers, but they don't have the ability to come into your hospital and tell you what to do, right? Even neither does CDC. And so these safety alerts really are sort of a legal and a clinical guide, if you will, to bring you up to speed on specific potential adverse event risk. Um, I will tell you, my brother happens to be in the legal community as a lawyer. Um, he looks at these things all the time. So does his firm. And so they are highly, highly used in litigation. And so it's very problematic, especially if you're the infection preventionist or the SPD manager um, and you're not familiar with what these things are. You want to make sure you sign up for those alerts on the FDA's website. And so the first one that came out was really saying, can we get away from just completely reusable devices and get to something that might have a disposable component, preferably one that's sterile? And so in this particular example, um, you know, sort of very similar to what we talked about the glucometers, here it was the distal end cap in the elevator. 
And so they went to the manufacturers and said, we need you to innovate. We need you to do something that's going to eliminate that risk so that we can actually just sort of solve this problem. Well, then they figured out, wait a minute, should we even be reprocessing in general? If people are not successful, it's taking too long, and we don't have good validation for this, and the validation's failing, should we even be doing reprocessing? And that was a big jolt to a lot of hospitals, especially because they don't know what to do in terms of what do I do with the people? What do I do with the reprocessing suite? Um, you know, How do I sort of manage this? Um, are there single-use devices that are even available out there that I can use? And so they started digging deeper and they found that everywhere they went, they found more risk, right? So now we've moved away from the GI space and they found the exact same problem in the urology space. No surprise. Well, then we looked during COVID and we found the same problem in the bronchoscopy space. Again, no surprise. Now, if we think about bronchoscopes in the context of COVID, this was sort of a problem because we were doing bronx on people. We were doing sputum inductions and all kinds of stuff, and we were aerosolizing stuff. And so it's not just a risk during the physical use of the device, but it was also the, potentially the use of aerosolizing um, infectious particles during the reprocessing process. And so FDA said, wow, we've got sort of this systemic issue with reusable medical devices, in this case, particularly scopes, but it's across all specialty areas. So how do we manage this with the different clinical societies and professions to bring awareness to this so that we can actually try to solve this? And so they broke this down into sort of two different buckets of things that we can control versus things that we can't, right? I can't control what the patient brings to the table if they're you know, uh, morbidly obese, if they're a chronic smoker, um, if they don't manage their diabetes as an example, but all of the other stuff, like how I monitor my device process, what competency I assess, um, how I'm going to really look at reprocessing, all of that type of stuff is completely within my control. Now, that doesn't mean that it's going to transfer to perfect, right? And so what we're looking for and what our patients expect, frankly, is perfect. They're not looking for a device that's contaminated. No one's coming to the hospital or the ASC and saying, give me that endoscope or give me that glucometer that's slightly contaminated. Their expectation is that that device is sanitary and ready to go. And a lot of this went back to holes in FDA's own regulation, right? So FDA does allow third party both reprocessing as well as repair. Unfortunately, neither of those areas is actually regulated by the FDA right? The first time I heard that, I literally spun my head around and I thought I could not have heard that correctly. That could not be right. So we regulate the device manufacturers, but we don't regulate any of the people that service and maintain the device outside of that initial realm. And so there was discussion about five years ago for FTA to start regulating. There was a lot of pushback, as you can imagine, and lobbying for different groups to not do that. And so the third parties are still not regulated. Um, there are a few that have voluntarily become regulated, but the majority of them are not. And so we've got a lot of inconsistency. We have potentially a lack of original equipment manufacturer parts, which can alter the devices and make them adulterated. Um, and then we certainly don't have the training uh, for these technicians to be repairing our devices. And this creates a really significant risk for us from an infection control perspective. And so part of this is figuring out the human factors dynamics, right? How do I operationalize this so that I am making my team successful upfront, right? If I, if I sort of stack the deck in their favor, then that's gonna be very advantageous. But if I don't give them the time and the training to do this, then that's not gonna work. And the feedback that came back to FDA during this 522 study was the reprocessing personnel felt a constant pressure from the physicians um, to get that device reprocessed quickly. Um, and so they were very cognizant of that because they could not do the next case until they had the device back. Um, and so there was always this constant time pressure, very similar to what we've seen in terms of pressure on our colleagues in environmental services where this room turnover was given sort of an unrealistic time frame. And so part of this was this, this list of a hit list, if you will, of identified risk. And so you can see things like hinges and areas where you can't decontaminate or see. One of the big things that they found with reusable medical devices, if they have O-rings, those O-rings become unsealed over time and microbial organisms adhere there, form biofilm. And every time you would flush or go through the device, part of that biofilm would be flushing the patient. Um, and that certainly can be very problematic for, for our patients that we're serving. 
Now, how do we get rid of this, right? Well, I always go back to that approach of the three Ps, people, process, product, and that order. You know, first of all, do I have the right people? I need the right people to do the work. Even if I'm using a disposable device, I still need people in the equation. And so they've got to be well-trained. They've got to be highly competent. They need to know that they're appreciated and part of a broader team. And we've got to make sure we maintain that competency because competency is not just a one-time assessment. It is an ongoing process that we continue to attain on a daily basis and hopefully improve over time. The second area, right, is evaluation of our process. Where are we today in terms of our baseline and where do we want to go, right? Is there a baseline we're using, you know, a single high-level disinfection, we're not doing any validation and we want to start culturing, right? Well, maybe that's one direction. Or maybe you decide that you don't want to fool with reprocessing at all and you decide to eliminate it, right, where you can. You know, my whole thing, and I'm sure Ruth would probably agree with this, is if we have the opportunity to eliminate a risk and do it safely, then that's going to be my choice every day of the week. Unfortunately, we don't always have that, that choice, right? Many of our technologies just are not there yet. But there are becoming increasingly large amounts of medical devices that have historically only been reusable that are now actually uh, single use. And so as long as the cost makes sense and the efficacy and sort of the the handling and and everything is still the same, then it really makes a lot of sense from an elimination standpoint to move forward with something like that. And so that's really where products come in. You know, how are we maintaining the different devices that we have? What is available for single use and what is not? Um, You know, we spent, for example, a fortune as a healthcare industry moving the entire market to a disposable blood pressure cuff. And I still don't know why, because I've yet to see outbreaks associated with reusable blood pressure cuffs. Can they become contaminated? Certainly. Um, but have we seen you know, mass outbreaks? No. And yet we moved the market to that. And yet we have high risk devices like flexible endoscopes and other surgical instrumentation where we know that the frequency incidence of infection and, and, and mortality and morbidity is really high, but we've taken no action or limited action Uh, which is certainly not what is in the best interest of our patients. And so it really leads us to these two different options, right? Do we go down a single use pathway? Um, And I would encourage you strongly if you do this to make sure that those single use devices are sterile, right? Do not accept something that's single use that is not sterile, um, unless it's a non-critical device, which is a little bit different, something like a blood pressure cuff. And then we certainly still have our reusable medical devices, which we know are inherently um, risky because of the reprocessing process, all the different things that go into that, the pieces of equipment, as well as storage and handling. And so if we think about this in the broader hierarchy, right, where should we be? You know, and I think that's a question that maybe we have a different opinion than our patients. You know, if you ask the patient, well, you're coming in for a procedure. Do you want a sterile instrument that's never been used on someone else? Or do you want an instrument that's been used on 2,323 people? Um, I don't think anyone's going to say the latter. They're going to pick the single-use sterile device, um, either that or a product that has been sterilized. And so unfortunately, we still don't have a lot on the, on the U.S. market, especially that is capable of undergoing routine sterilization multiple times without degradation to the devices. And so that's really where we're starting to see a movement and a groundswell is through these single-use devices. Keep in mind that single-use um, devices can come in lots of different forms. And so it's important to get a hold of the manufacturer's instructions for use um, prior to utilization. Our semi-critical devices have a minimum of high-level disinfection, but there's no problem doing sterilization as long as it's validated by the manufacturer. Again, give yourself a little bit more wiggle room in terms of of that removing that edge, if you will, of patient safety risk. And it goes back to this question about really are all these device-related infections preventable? Um, If it is caused by the device, I have to say they are, right? Because we have the possibility and and uh, and actually really the ability to remove that risk from the equation, if at all possible. Either we do better reprocessing and we validate that, maybe we do culturing, or better yet, we use a single-use device that doesn't even have this inherent risk associated with it. And so part of this really is getting down to the hierarchy of controls. We know at the very, very top here, these are the most effective interventions where we eliminate the risk. So an example would be you're currently using a um, a reusable laryngoscope, right? And you're doing low level disinfection, which is not even correct. You should be doing at least high level and you move to sterilization. 
right? That's going to eliminate the risk as long as you actually do sterilization correctly. Or a better yet is move to disposable handles and blades, right? Or at least a disposable blade. The same is true for endoscopes. Maybe you are using uh, a different level of engineering control um, and you're going to actually move to single use and you go up to elimination, right? If there's no more reprocessing, more, no more reuse, then the risk of contamination to the next patient really goes away. Um, and so we always need to think in this sort of critical thinking context to make sure we're thinking very clearly and rationally, but also holistically um, about the bigger picture of what our realistic expectation and goals are. And so I always go back to this graphic, which I love about, you know, if you're the patient, right, which one do you pick? Do you pick door A, which is continue to do what we've always done before, knowing that the outcome is going to be the same, there's not going to be any change, there's patient safety risk, there's contamination issues, there's device failures, or do we go down this new door, which is pathway B, and continue to demand from our industry partners better solutions clinically that are single use and sterile, where we can eliminate this, this pesky process of reprocessing and actually sleep a little bit better at night. And it always goes back to this cost versus benefit equation, right? What is that risk and how does it outweigh by the potential benefits? And then matching that up with the cost effectiveness and so I'd encourage you, you know, if you're an infection preventionist, especially to work with your value analysis colleagues, your risk management people, as well as your biomed and SPD departments to really get a comprehensive team-based approach here and evaluate these technologies um, to see what they've got going on. Here's just a little bit of a cross-comparison chart in terms of the, the, the benefits and, and sort of the risk associated with reusable versus disposable. Um, this is available in your slides. I'm not going to go through this just in the interest of time. In terms of sterilization, right, that really should be our end goal is terminal sterilization, but it's not always available. And so we may have to take incremental approaches, again, within the lines of the manufacturer's validation to increase the, you know, sort of likelihood of success. So maybe you were only doing low-level disinfection and you didn't realize you were supposed to be doing high level. We'll get up to at least the minimum level now. Or if you're doing high level and you want to go to sterilization, um, that's something that you can really be proud of because we're always moving that needle forward to advance patient safety with some of these quite risky devices. And the FDA also put out um, this list of next generation medical devices, and I included the hyperlink there at the bottom. This was sort of a wish list of things that they were asking for. And they really went to industry and said, hey, we need help, right? These are the things that we think we can do better, but we need to challenge you um, to develop these solutions. And they were they were good in partnering with industry to say, if you bring these to us, we'll do an expedited review to try to get these onto the market quickly. Um, and so the goal again was to take the known risk and then mitigate that with device design improvements, but that's not gonna get rid of everything. And so if we can eliminate reprocessing, that's gonna help us. Um, especially if you're in a facility where you have after hours call coverage, you have maybe learners um, that might be coming in. Um, you know, this is something that we see quite often. I remember doing an outbreak investigation in California, and they had a scope that, believe it or not, was used on an animal at a zoo. No one told anybody in the OR that they took the scope. Um, they had a relationship with a veterinary clinic, and so they went to one of the zoos in California, used this device on a, on a tiger, um, and then put it right back in the cabinet as if nothing had ever happened. And the only reason it was caught was because it was caught on security camera. And somebody happened to see it, um, one of the security officers did, and thought it was very strange uh, that it was placed back in the cabinet, not in the wrap that it normally was in, right? Had it not been for that astute security officer, who knows what would have happened with that. But you've still got to have a backup plan, right? And so we're never going to get rid of our people and our personnel that are involved in this process, but we want to eliminate as much as possible uh, the known risk with that. And so that's really where this progressive approach comes from is sort of start with your baseline, look at, you know, disposable componentry, move from HLD or high level disinfection to sterilization, and ideally get to a point of single use if the device category has something that has the 510K approvals from the FDA. But at the end of the day, our patient has one expectation. They expect that that device is ready, clean, and ready to be used for them. Um, they don't have an expectation that this device has been used on hundreds or thousands of patients, and they certainly don't come to their probably elective procedure and say, I don't mind getting an MDRO, right? They're, they have the expectation that everything is being done to safeguard them 
from these preventable risks. And so that's a really big burden that we carry on our shoulders um, as healthcare professionals. And so as we sort of summarize and see what questions you have, right, it all goes back into critical thinking. When you can eliminate, eliminate. When you can't, do the next best thing, right? Step up your game. And a lot of that goes back to establishing a baseline and really knowing what's taking place in your facility, going and walking around, rounding all those types of things. Because if we can get to a point of awareness, it allows us to get to a point of action. And at the end of the day, that is what our patients are expecting. And that is what we need to be doing for our patients. We are all patients and consumers of healthcare as well. Um, and so this is a topic, like I said, that is so beneath the surface, but so, I think, uh, important for us to talk about. And one, frankly, that the FDA has got a lot more work to do. Um, this is, you know, a couple categories that we discussed today, but there are many, many more categories that exist out there that have not even been uncovered um, as a risk. And, and we still got to deal with those also. So with that, Dr. Kerko, I'll stop and see what questions we have from the group. Thanks very much. That was a, a very good overview, I think, of a problem that that uh, everybody had prior to COVID, but I think is even uh, more pronounced uh, post-COVID. And I think, you know, it, I'd be interested in your, your thoughts about one of the responses that I'm hearing across facilities are to try to hire or make the you know, ha have someone that is designated within facilities as kind of their disinfection czar or czarina, you know, somebody that whose responsibility is to go around and look and understand the pieces of equipment that are reusable and I guess do a risk assessment from the mm -hmm. perspective of reusable medical equipment. Any any thoughts or insights that you have about about that as an approach? I mean, I think in generalities, it, it makes sense, but it also can be a double-edged sword, right? You know, if you put that sole responsibility on one person, it essentially removes it from everyone else. And, you know, each department needs to own their, their, their facility, their operations, and their clinical procedures, and all the equipment that goes with it. So I, I would really see a, a much more sustainable approach would be to have multiple individuals throughout the organization that have that expertise, um, you know, maybe have a team, for example, where you've got SPD, you've got biomechanical engineering, um, you've got environmental services, you've got infection prevention, value analysis, materials, everybody coming together, right? That's probably a much more winning strategy that could be um, sort of utilized across large health systems than to give one person the sole responsibility because that person's not going to catch everything. Um, and it's not fair to, to put that burden on one individual as well. Now, the risk assessment, I do think, should be done more corporately, if you will. Um, but sort of the implementation and the monitoring should really be done in the unit. Um, we need to in encourage sort of that shared accountability model. Yeah, and I think, you know, at a lot of the, the comments have been, uh, and I think Pat Lewis just put that part of the risk manager's responsibility as well as department managers and others. Pat, I co completely agree. And then what about, you know, settings like long-term care and mm -hmm. outpatient where, you don't have the level of, of oversight, perhaps, or you don't have just the resources or the number of, of people. And the, the risk may be very different. For example, maybe perhaps lower in long-term care because you may not be dealing with some invasive um, uh, equipment or equipment that, that uh, addresses that kind of high level um, a category. But in the outpatient setting, maybe just the opposite. You know, we're seeing a lot of movement of procedures mm -hmm. into the outpatient setting. So what should we be thinking if we're trying to find this, this balanced approach, balanced yet safe approach? I would say it's almost like hospital capabilities only accept what you're capable of taking care of. So if you're a long-term care facility, you don't really have any reason to have critical or semi-critical devices in your building. Um, a, a few exceptions to that would be maybe you have a podiatrist or somebody that's coming by with a procedure kit um, and they're bringing in their own sterile instrumentation or something like that. But that's really the exception to the rule or a wound debridement or something like that. But outside of that, you're not going to have any scopes. Um, you know, I don't even know a long-term care facility anymore that even has a laryngoscope. Um, they've all sort of gone to a basic life support response capability so I would say eliminate any risk that you don't have the capability of properly managing. Um, the same is true, I think, to your point in the outpatient arena. The outpatient arena scares the living hell out of me um, because you have scopes and drawers, you have scopes on, on terry cloth towels, you have all kinds of 
of weird things that go on and you have very little oversight. Um, I know one health system here where I live um, that has one person that has over 500 outpatient clinics for all of their sterilization. Um, and all 500 clinics have something that they sterilize. That is not a winning strategy. Um, and so we've got to figure out more centralized ways to either provide everything already sterile, um, where there's nothing that's done on site, or maybe some type of courier mechanism where every, we've got sort of regional satellites that can just do reprocessing in a more standardized fashion. Um, but I, I think that that's got to be a necessary conversation we've got to have from a risk management standpoint. I think that's great. Angela, I know you uh, you had a hand up. I, I bet you've got some some very relevant questions and comments. I do. Um, and, and Hudson hit the nail on the head. We are seeing an increase in um, scopes in the outpatient setting. I am in ambulatory care. And so in arenas like oncology and ENT and GI, um, we are starting to see an increase in scope usage in those areas. Hudson, are you um, aware of any um, commercial entities that exist where um, like sterilization can be done through a vendor? Um, because our challenge that we have is we rely on the hospital sterile processing departments who are already incredibly overwhelmed um, to help us reprocess our instruments. Uh, and it's becoming more and more challenging. And I was just curious if you know of any um, vendors that, you know, that we could contract that service to. I know of at least two. Um, probably the biggest one is based out of Raleigh-Durham. Um, they, they have customers all over the, the country. Um, Angela, if you want to shoot me an email, I'll be happy to try to connect you with um, one of the sterilization experts there. They've got a couple of different services and they also can build, depending upon your needs, sort of like a local service center where they pick your stuff up, you know, once or twice a day, they do everything in their shop and then they bring it back to you that night or first thing in the morning. So there's a couple different options that you can do. And there, there are some on-site pieces too, but it's you typically cost prohibitive to do those. Yeah. I think that, I think your comment that we're going to see more and more of these types of, of uh, options available mm -hmm. because it is becoming incredibly complex. And I think Alana Newkirk said one issue that she's seen is some managers are managing multiple units may not know anything about endoscopy, therefore would not know if there are any issues in reprocessing or right. know how to assess competency. So that whole approach of, you know, know what you are doing in your unit and then having a process for risk assessment is important. But what else, Hudson, might you think about in, in those types of, of situations? So I'm, I'm actually doing a webinar um, next week with for SGNA. Um, it's available to the public. So if you're interested, if you just go to the sgna.org website, you'll see it right on their homepage on, on this very type of topic. Um, the other thing I would say to your, to your point is that there is a whole standards checklist that they have for management for infection control associated with reusable scopes um, that I would encourage you to check out. Um, the other thing that they've got that I think is fantastic is they have their infection control champions program which is all related to um, you know, these types of units where you really need those additional resources and the support infrastructure and something a little bit more formal. Um, and so they run that throughout the year. It's a year long program and it's got tons and tons of resources. Um, and so I'd encourage you to, to check that out. Um, that, that's again, available on the SGNA website, which I'll drop in the chat for you right now. You know, you've also Gordon. talked about value, you know, value purchasing, you know, mm -hmm. how do you look at doing that value analysis and making determinations about how do we pick um, what is the cost of reprocessing versus what is the cost of, of uh, a single use and disposable? And you, and you touched on this in the, the session. Is there any, you know, anything else that you think we might need to consider when trying to look at that? You know, is it worth it? Is it not worth it? How do I begin to approach, you know, where, where, where's the sweet spot if one exists? How should we be looking at that? Yeah, so, so ARN has a cost calculator too that looks at the total cost of reprocessing. Um, some of the, the different vendors do as well um, because when you look at that total picture, you're almost always going to figure out that single use is the way to go. Um, despite what people may tell you up front, because you're looking at the AERs, the chemicals, the validation, the training, the, the, the employee time, all the PPE that's needed, it's never going to win to do re reusable, at least in the, the calculations that I performed. 
Um, so you've got to think to your point really more strategically. So it's clinical, financial, and operational. And that's how you're going to change the sort of mindset of administration to say, yes, I need to spend maybe a little bit more initially on the device, but it's going to bring a, a revenue savings and the reduction in infections and frankly, the operational efficiencies. You know, if Dr. Ramirez, for example, is a gastroenterologist and he's standing there waiting for that device and I don't have to wait anymore because there's no more reprocessing, he's able to see twice the patients in a day. His RVUs are going to go way up. He's going to be very happy with me. And we don't have any infection control risk because we're not reprocessing, right? Everybody in the equation is happy, but we have to bring all the different functionalities together to have that holistic conversation as a family. And I think that's the problem. We do so many things siloed. Well, I think that the, if we transition to uh, to disposable devices, then there's you know there's some technique adjustments. Right. So as you, it's not only the people then that are involved in determining the the value and the the process savings, but it's who's going to actually be using the device and is it acceptable? Uh, do they feel that you know that they're going to be able to use it as effectively or as efficiently? So, do they have confidence in the device? Right. So, you know, bringing everybody into that discussion then becomes very important. And and then once you have a process, you're going to use that to to march through probably a variety of different types of products um, to ask the same questions. Not all of them may be, you know, the the it may not not all of them may benefit from reusable, disposable, reusable, but some may. And then you kind of clearly know, then where do you need to put your efforts and where uh, where do you not need to put your efforts? One uh, comment, uh, one question. Then, because um, I have, let's say that, that in an outpatient setting, mm-hmm. um, a group of physicians or infection prevention, they, they are, they want, they, they have, um, uh, endoscope and they want to see if there is any possibility that the endoscope is contaminated or, or not. Do we have any any way that I can say, okay, well, I'm going to do a sample of my endoscope just as a way of, of making sure that in this clinic I'm doing the, the right thing. And I just, um, as a comment, uh, I, I saw a, a physician that um, that um, without uh, without comorbidities, healthy, that uh, needs to have a cystoscopy because of an enlarged uh, prostate, uh, and and after the cystoscopy, develop a, a prostatitis with a multi-resistant gram-negative organism that require you know IV antibiotics. There was no way. There was not even a single antibiotic. It required weeks of IV antibiotics. And this was just a cystoscopy. In my mind, I have no question that that it was the procedure that that brought the multi-resistant organism and the prostatitis. Then uh, this is, as you as you alluded, Hudson, I would be very concerned to go to any clinic <laughs> and <laughs> that someone is doing anything. But again, but we have to do it because sometimes you know, there is no other way. Uh, but if someone wants to know, okay, I, I don't want to cause any harm. And I have all this, I'm doing the cystoscopy or I'm doing the any form of endoscopy. Any possibility to to have some confidence that, that what I'm doing to the patient is safe? So there is a validated protocol that was done in collaboration with the FDA, the CDC, and the American Society for Microbiology that was um, initially developed for duodenoscopes and then adapted for colonoscopes. Um, there is no validated protocol for any of the other devices as of yet. That being said, excuse me, you can adapt it, if you will. It's not a perfect science, but you can adapt it in order to do the proper recovery. Um, one of the things that we've learned is that no hospital lab is picking up the contamination at all. Um, it had to go to an environmental lab. That was really one of the key findings. And so if you go down that pathway, um, you know, you want to make sure you're using one of the three FDA certified labs that is is really designated for this type of work. Um, and then you can do a culture for that. So if anybody's interested in obtaining that protocol, I'm happy to share a PDF of it if you want to shoot me an email. Okay, thank you. Sure. You can see that, you know, there are a lot of interest in, in this topic. So, I, you know, I think this has been a great discussion and I don't see any additional uh, questions, but I know probably people have them in their minds. So this may be an example of, 
you know, if, if people do have questions, uh, email them either directly to uh, Dr. Garrett. He's got his, con uh, his contact information there, or you can send it back uh, to me at, at Norton Healthcare or to the, the training center. And we'll be glad to uh, send those on then to Hudson for his comments to, to get that back to you. But this is really an area where, the, you know, we know that there is a lot of emphasis, both in the very simple reusable devices, up to the very complex reusable devices. And uh, we know that decisions are costly, uh, but this is a great example of the need for infection prevention and control coming together and having this multidisciplinary approach. So Hudson, thank you again very much. A, a great presentation, very thought provoking. Thanks to uh, the participants. It's always great to not only see your chats, but it's also great to hear your voices. So, uh, you know, so we can have these types of uh, very important discussions. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, we will uh, see you back next Wednesday. I think Tatiana put information about uh, the upcoming grand rounds. Uh, we'll be learning about the ABCs of beta lactamases uh, next week from Dr. Alan Junkins. And we look forward to seeing you then.